That's all we can say. Wow. Well, it was a good time seeing Brother James, man, hearing the Word of God preach. Absolutely. Good time. That's a haul down there, man. I forgot how long it is, man. No matter, honestly, no matter how much you break Romans 13, it's still 65 minutes to my house. I mean, I, okay, it was 63 minutes last night because the angel's wings gar- guided me through past the troopers. It, it's, just, it's just the way it is, man. And Route 2 is not even a problem, man. It's just, it, it's just the ways to get down there. The worst part is getting off the highway. That Jonathan Trumbull, anything with Jonathan is a bad thing, man. But uh, that Jonathan Trumbull highway or whatever, that thing, that's the worst part. You're at the exit in like no time, and then you're like, it's like another hour from here, man. They used to have that creepy psychotic hospital down there, and they took it down. I kind of bummed out, man. I figured we'd have a little ghost adventure there, Justin, man. Going there with our Bibles and, you know, slinging holy water around, freaking everybody out, man. Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. You know, that stuff is crazy, man. Them people playing with ghosts and thinking they're, those things are friendly. or You're playing with devils, man. You know what's really cool about the word familiar spirit? This is just me because I'm a weirdo with the English language. That spirit is a family liar. What's the last four words of familiar? What do most spirits show up as? Mom, an auntie, a loved one. And how come these people that channel these spirits or allegedly talk to these spirits, how come they never get like the guy in Luke 16 that's burning forever? They always get a yellow rose or a, or a white rose or things are great. The Bible says it's a narrow way to God's glory. And that probably, probably eight out of ten go to hell for the rejection of Jesus Christ. And yet you're having all those seances and all those readings and all that stuff and you only, you have, you, you have, no, you have no negative reports. Not that you guys ever play around that, but uh, yeah. Playing with Ouija boards, as you know, that word is a compound word of yes and yes. We in France, ya in German, it's a yes, yes board. It'll tell you what you want to hear. So, anyway, I got a couple questions for you tonight because I just started reading the Bible last night, as a matter of fact, down in Ledyard, and I need, need some help with this, man. So I need to know, if you could tell me, please, what is the name of the field Judas was buried in? The specific name. There's actually two, but one is the, is the, is the Hebrew tongue, and then, it, then the interpretation is, what is the name of the field Judas was buried in? Because remember, they, he took the 30 pieces, threw them down, they gathered them up, they said, we can't put this in the treasury, this is blood money, and innocent, innocent blood was shed. So they went out and they bought a field with that, with that money. What's the name of that field in a King James Bible? Whoever has it, raise your hand, stand up. Karen's got it, go ahead. It's what, I'm sorry? That's not the correct answer, ma'am. You can start walking home now or call an Uber. The Potter Street, now, I, I think Mike Vendette, that's a big, Mike, this is a big night, man. Slow down, man. I'm about to go, <laughs> I'm about to go through the drywall, man, with excitement. Go ahead, man. Look at, 
to feel there. You, see, K, K dogs in the house. Okay, so you're in Acts chapter number one. Uh, Mike, can you read 18 and 19, please? Acts chapter one, 18 and 19. You say, go ahead. That's cool. Wow. I fell them on, man. The field of blood. Potter's Field, you're in the neighborhood. You're in the neighborhood, K Dog, but. Mike, good job, buddy. You got that. You know what? It's good. It works for me, man. Let's do this. I need the two major chapters in the King James Bible that deal with leprosy and how to treat it. The two main, there, I know it's mentioned, in, I, I understand that it's mentioned in many, but there's really two significant chapters in your King James Bible that tell you how to deal with leprosy. Do you know it? Okay, ask, Jen has the mid up first. No, sorry, man. Did you have your hand up, Polly? Oh, okay. All right. Don't rub your head like you're having a migraine, man, or nothing. You're freaking me out. Go ahead. Um, Leviticus 13. That would be one of them. What would be the other one? Well, I'm I'm hoping you weren't pointing the finger at me like you're at home. The, uh, you know what I'm talking about, Jen. No, you're, you're right there. Leviticus 13. How about... No. Go ahead, Frank. Leviticus 14. <laughs> they're, they're, right to, they're right together. <laughs> That's funny stuff. Frank, you're the best, man. Uh, Jennifer, read 1, 2, and 3 of Leviticus 13. Now, all kidding aside, what's an, um, and I'm not trying to make this a mnemonic device or an acrostic or an acronym or anything, but what's an easy way to remember leprosy is found in this chapter right here? Go ahead. Number, it's 13. Number of rebellion. You say you're, you're crazy about that. No, go to Numbers 13. Go to Genesis 13. Go to John 13. Go to Revelation 13. Oh, that, that's just you thinking that way. They didn't have any numbering system for chapters or verses until about mid-1500s. And it's not perfected and purified until the King James Bible. So don't, I've read it a couple times. The numbers and punctuation, and they're there specifically by Almighty God. And they will, they will clue you into some really awesome stuff. Okay, Jennifer, get the first, two, uh, first three verses, please. Go over to uh, chapter 14. Frank, you helped out with, a, with the, the obvious answer, so we're going to give you an obvious couple verses. Can you read uh, just, and I know there's a bunch. Actually, you know what? Read 1 through 7, please. 1 through 7, Frank, of Leviticus 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look and behold... If the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then shall the priest command to take for him mm -hmm. to be cleansed, two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in the earth in an earth vessel over running water. Hmm. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird into the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, mm -hmm. and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. Man, that is so rich with preaching material. And then you find running water, Holy Ghost, right? John chapter 7. Uh, you got the hiss up there, the scarlet. How about... How about the, five, uh, the seven times? Do you know of a man that was 
told to go do something seven times to get rid of his leprosy? Naaman in 2 Kings chapter number 5. It's pretty cool, man. You, you can't beat this King James Bible, man. You're, you're never going to beat it. How it can be spread across, uh, spread across multiple continents, multiple authors, and yet one real author, the Holy Ghost of God. Go with me over to Matthew 8 and give you a little bit of a backup to what you just read in there. It's found in the other uh, Mark and Luke as well, but go to Matthew 8 if you could. Justin, why don't you get Matthew 8, 1 through 4, please. And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus saith unto him, there you go. Yep. Show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So Jesus Christ was a law keeper and pointing people to the law for this man that was a leper. Yeah, I cleansed you, but still go do what Moses told you to do. Well, I told Moses to tell you. Sometimes you read the words of Jesus Christ and you go, well, they're not in red, they must not be his. If you have a red letter Bible, that's cool, but aren't they all his words? And sometimes, you know, when the Pharisees would attack him or the publicans would come after him, they'd say, well, Moses said, well, who do you think told Moses to write it down or to speak it first and foremost? The God that's the author of all of it, man. So sometimes you get confused, say, well, well, well that, that, that's, Jesus didn't say that. He said every bit of it. It doesn't mean you don't rightly divide or have dispensational truth or any of that, but you, you need to know this is all his book, man. And he told me, he said, you know what, go, go off your gift, just like Moses told you to do in Leviticus 14. That's pretty cool, man. I, I like that, man. All right, I need a couple verses on riches and rich. That's all you got to do. Simple task, man. As the clock ticks, put your pencil down when you hit it. Just, yep, we'll go around for a few of them. All right, I've got Jennifer and then Justin. But he hates to be rich. So, what would be some way to be rich hastily? Just top of your head. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, just say it, Jonathan. Don't be whispering over there, man. Come on. I'm on you tonight, man, tight. I'm, gonna, I'm staying on you like a, I'm on you like a tick, man. The lottery. The lottery. That's conviction right there, man. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, what else? Get people out of their money with false Yeah, I mean, false balance. I mean, any way to make a quick buck and not work for it. If God has allowed you to become rich through labor, intellect, and all that stuff, and offer to time and offer, praise the Lord for it, man. But to, you know, subvert that system, God says, uh, yeah, you're not going to be blessed at the end of that, man. Not, not a good thing. Go ahead, Justin. Proverbs 23, 4. Labor not to be rich, rich. rich cease from thine own wisdom. Rich. What's the next verse say? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away. Go ahead. Well, thou set thine eyes upon, upon that, that which is not. not. For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an equal toward heaven. Yeah, man. There's a verse over in Haggai that says your money burns a hole in your pocket. Don't tell me the King James Bible ain't up to date, man. Jonathan and then Taylor and then James. Ecclesiastes 5.12. Yep. The sleep of the laboring man is sweet. Yes, it is. That's, man, working guy usually sleeps well, man. That's why back in the day you worked 12 hours a day and just KO'd, man. I like the end of that. But the abundance of the rich shall, uh, will not suffer him to sleep. What does that mean? The abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. W what does that mean to you? I, I, I've got so much out there. I need more locks, more alarms. I need more, uh, I need more fence. I need a moat with crocodiles in it. I need a great white shark tank. I need guns. I need, yeah. Because when you have a lot, you have to protect a lot. Or at least you think you do. So, Taylor and then James, go ahead. Proverbs 13, 7. There is that make it himself rich, rich. There is that make it himself great Amen. Why are you guys all in Proverbs anyway? What's going on with that? Sunday mornings or something? What's going on there? James, go ahead. Uh, Revelation 2, 8 and 9. 
Oh, man. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, mm -hmm. these things say the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and thy tribulation, thy poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. You guys remember that from when we preached through those churches? What does Laodicea say? We are rich. What does the Lord say about them? What's He say about these people? They say we're poor and He says, Oh no, man, you're so rich you don't even know. Again, it, it doesn't matter what other people think about you. It's the Lord's accounting system and it's the Lord's direction through His Bible and the Holy Ghost that will make you rich at the judgment seat of Christ. I have no idea what you do for the Savior. I hope you do well for Him. We do a few things together as a church, but the reality is you have your own individual life and walk with Jesus Christ, and He knows exactly how that account and how to take account of that life. And you might think, I've got nothing at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord says, no, you did it right at the right time under my auspices and under the correct will of God, and look, look at everything you, that you've got. And there's other people together and say, oh man, I worked all my life for Jesus. I can't wait to see the, the, bank, the bank he's got for me. And you get up there and you're like, where is it all? Well, he dispensed a lot of that when you're a prodigal. He dispensed a lot of that when you're needed grace and mercy, which I know he gives you. But that, that's just the way I, I perceive it from the Word of God is that you know, a, lot of, a lot of saved people use up their inheritance down here. Saved, yes. Eternally secure, 100%. But when you get home to glory, you'll be wanting. It's, it's not, not you'd, ra you'd rather have it up there, not down here. Who else you got? I got Kenny, and then got a few more. Kenny, and then we'll go over this side. Did we do 1420? We did not. Uh, the book of Ken, yes. Oh, yeah, the rich hath many friends. You know what happens, man, if you've been spending any time in the world. When you got the cash, everybody's your buddy. When the cash dries up, eh. how does the Bible know this? Now, man wrote that. Yeah, if he did, he's got a lot of insight into your life that you don't like. It's pretty good, man. Wealth does make many friends. Uh, you know that by the boxers that have millions, I mean hundreds of millions, and they have nothing. But they got to have an entourage and six or seven cars. I remember a baseball player named Jack, I, I, can, I can see Jack Clark, that's his name. Power hitter in the, uh, in the 80s. St. Louis Cardinals, thinking with the Red Sox for a little while. That guy made millions of dollars back when a million really meant something. And he left and he was broke. I don't know if his agent took some from him, but there was an article I remember vividly. He said he had a luxury car for every day of the week. Well, if you, I get it, I guess you got it, you spend it, but there's no thought for tomorrow, man. You got to put maybe a little bit of weight. You're only going to be able to play baseball, football, basketball, anything until you're, what, 35? If you're fortunate, the reality is you're done probably in three years, three and a half years. So, interesting. Mike, go ahead. I got, I got you, Mo. I see the hand. I see you freaking out over there. There you go. <laughs> That's still one of the best verses ever, man. And it doesn't mean a camel outside the wall of Jerusalem that was so small that they had unlaid the burden from the camel and the camel had to get down and then scoots through. No. Stupid. He meant the eye of a needle. So you'd have to take that camel, lick the camel all the way from head to tail, and then take him and take it through a needle and then and he's spitting at you and you got to thread him through. That's, that's what he said. It's not, oh, well, you can do it if you take all the stuff off his back. And if he's out, like, would you like one lump or two lumps with that? You know, and then, he, you, know, he sco you know, he scoots down. He sco you ever seen a camel get on all four? Yeah, those things spring up, man, like nothing. But how, they're going to get, so the, the hole in the wall is big enough for a camel to get through? That totally ruins that. But yet you'll read scholars and say, well, that's what he really meant. No, he really meant a camel through the eye of a needle. 
And he didn't say there's anything wrong with being riches. What did you read, Mike? It's they who do what in riches? They trust. It's like the, what, what does everybody always misquote over in 1 Timothy 6.10? They always say, for money, it's the root of all evil. What's the King James Bible say? For, that's, one of the, that's one of the foremost verses changed in every Bible. I wonder why that is. What's the greatest money-making book ever printed? It's a money-making scheme, man. You know what you can do with your King James Bible right now if you want to because there's no copyright other than the King's print? You can take this and scan this and give as many of them away as you want without having to pay a, a publisher. You know what you have to do with a copyright? After about 200, 250 words, you've got to pay them. You've got to pay them for the right to copy it. God says, you know what? The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of them that published it. Buy the truth and sell it not. Psalm 68, 11 in the same, same spot in Proverbs 23. You buy it, you invest in it, and you give it away. That's why there's Bibles in the back, man. Go take them. Take them and hand them out to people. Or forget them when you go to Woodlake and don't bring them to anybody. <laughs> you were just going to say that? Okay. All right, man. Go ahead, Melissa. And then, Paul, you're going last for that. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Mo. Charge them that are rich in this world to be not high-minded. Go ahead, Mo. No, you're no. You can read it. You need to practice. For the the Lord, the Lord told me last night. Amen. Amen. Well, you might as well. Yeah, you you've gone too far now. You're drowning. Just go drown all the way. Go ahead. So God does give you riches. He gives you all things richly to enjoy. Don't trust in uncertain riches. Yeah, man. It's good stuff. Go ahead, Paulie, please. No, oh, going Paul only with your woman, huh? Okay. All right, man. All right, kid. Fire away. What a great verse. People say, what's the grace of God? Right there. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. It's the, it's the one that owns everything, gives it all up, and can't even find a place to be born in. And says, no, you guys be rich, I'll be poor. <whistles> Muhammad didn't do that for you. Buddha did not do that for you. Joel Osteen won't do that for you. I'm not saying you have to be poor, but there's something about that that typically lends itself to more spirituality. When you don't have as much physically, you tend to rely on the Lord more. That's just a fact of the matter. That's why American Christianity is down the tubes. Frank, you had your hand up for a second or a third, or a, is this your first run? All right, go ahead, kid. Last one. Frank's going Frank's to close us in prayer. No, go ahead. We did not. Did Mark of the Beast and Paulie read, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> okay? The lay, the lay it through in the, the might. Go ahead. And Jesus said over against the treasury. And Love it. How the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. It's hard to stop there, isn't it, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasure. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. That's the kind of stuff right there you're going to see the judgment seat. What about the woman that broke open the alabaster box of ointment? What did the Lord say about her? She's done what she could. That's all you're going to be required to do. You're not going to be required of what I ask you to do. You're going to be asked to do whatever you can do 
for your Savior what He has gifted you and talented you with for Him. You're not here to please the Baptist church. You're here to do whatever you can for Jesus Christ. I don't know what that is. We don't all have the same opportunity, or I should say we don't have the same amount of opportunity. You just try to take it when you can, man, for the Savior. Lord, give an account to him. What, what, what have you, what'd you do, servant? You wicked and slothful servant. Lord, I just did what I could do with what you gave me. Good job. That's all yours over there. Probably point to that woman right there, man. Go over with me to Joshua chapter 5. All right, mystery of iniquity. Enough of that blurby latent stuff going on, craziness. Putting you guys on the spot, making fun of you. I really don't like that, I'll be honest with you. It hurts me. Joshua chapter number 5. It's good for you, man. If I was to ask you right now your favorite movie line or two, you could probably give it to me. If I, could, if I asked you what your favorite rock song used to be or country westerner, or some, God forbid, some un, unholy thing like that. You could probably sing it to me right now if it came on. But when the Bible comes out, you can just see what the battle really is, how it, you struggle with the things that are important, spiritual things, but the stuff that's just ingrained in you and brainwashed into you by your flesh, oh, that comes back like that. Right down by the starter cell where I, and down old Uncle Hank, you know where I'm talking, the old starter cell, Dave Jarrest was down there. Right when you walk through, before you go through the big vinyl door, you guys know where it's at, into uh, where my crib is down there. That's my crib. But uh, right there, they have the starter cell on the right. I can remember walking by, and I used to stop and talk to Dave Jarrest, try, try to witness to him, man, the best I could, and talk to him a little bit. And Dan Webster was, went off to eternity and all that stuff. And, and every once in a while, you'd walk by and you'd hear the radio playing, and you'd hear Van Halen. And I'm like, oh, that is just terrible, man. Just don't even, honestly, if you've never heard it, don't, don't even waste your time with it. Because you won't get rid of it very easily. It'll stick with you. And then you hear that and you hear that, you know, that chord. And then you know, the song comes on, Running with the Devil. And you're like, I don't want to run with the devil. But it just shows you how your flesh gravitates towards that stuff, man. Even as a saved person, saved almost 40 years. It's an everyday battle, man. Everyday battles. But you know what? I get worried when say people don't have that conviction. If it doesn't bother you and your sin doesn't bother you and you never get upset with your sin, something's wrong with your walk with Jesus Christ. I did not say you lost your salvation because you can't. It's His. But there's something wrong with your walk with Jesus Christ if there's no Bible conviction on you when you sin in thought, word, or deed. So with that said, and that cheery note, let's go to the mystery of iniquity and we'll get into it, man. We looked at last time, a couple weeks ago, before we were interrupted last week, not by Brother James, but by Ken Dog. Ken went off the rails last week. But it was good, man. It was very good. I want to be able to have that freedom if that's the way God leads it, seriously. Because we have enough verses to go through that we could have a good time in that. But if that's the way the Lord leads it, that's, that's good stuff. So Joshua 5, we left off a couple weeks ago looking at the mystery of iniquity and starting it. I wanted to kind of, from the Word of God, bring it to your, to your heart and your mind as we read these verses. The mystery of iniquity, what did he say over in 2 Thessalonians 2 about the mystery of iniquity? What was one of the things he said about it? It already what? It doth already work. So when Paul's around 2,000 years ago, he said this mystery, this mystery of iniquity, the one that withholds the son of perdition, the man of sin, that's been around and been in vogue for forever. Now, I understand between Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, it's not a gap, it's a flood. And I know the first God of this world, who's now still the God's world, because God gives him the reign over it, as he sees fit, is Lucifer. He's now Satan. And I know the sons of God and all that stuff. So, when God made Lucifer the anointed cherub, not an angel, He made him perfect and complete. Remember we read that? The knowledge and He sums up... If, if you could sum up everybody and everything, Lucifer summed it all up. Beautiful from head to toe, uh, bejeweled all over, could make music as he talked. In fact, he had tabrets and pipes, work machine with tabrets and pipes, and were inside him. But what did the Lord say about that creature, the anointed cherub? You were perfect in the day of Socrates until what was found in you? 
iniquity. Why would he pick that not sin? And why would this mystery revolving around the Antichrist involve iniquity? And then he's the son of perdition, which we know is SOP, that's Judas Iscariot. And he's also called the man of sin. But it's called the mystery of iniquity. Iniquity has been around, we looked at back in Genesis 15, but pick it up with me in Joshua chapter number 5. Kenny, we, are, we already had our boy read right here, so let's do this. Let's go to... Uh, hmm. Let's go 5, 1 through 9, Kenny, if you could. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is... That's a pretty weird <laughs> statement. I mean, that's just, I mean, yeah. you read your Bible and you're like, wow. What did David have to go get as a dowry for his wife? He had a hundred, go to a hundred, he goes, ah, here's 200, here's another hundred on top of that. That's a, that's a wild situation, man. That's your, that's your wedding. Yeah, I want, you know what? I want to I marry your, your married daughter. You know what I'll take for your daughter? A hundred foreskins. Couldn't you just register at the bridal gallery? No, I'm, I mean, read it, I'm reading it going, wouldn't it just been easier to go to like, you know, Lecter's, the kitchen place, and pick out a blender? No, I want 100 foreskins. Okay, well, I'll get you two. It's just, it's unbelievable how real, you know what I say that for? It's not to make fun of the Bible, it's how real your Bible is, man. And people don't even know stuff like that is in there, and they don't give it a chance by reading it. And say it's boring and dry. This stuff is, this stuff's off the hook, man. Go ahead. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, mm -hmm. but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sw sware that he would not show them the land, which the Lord sware unto their fathers that he would give us, a land that flourished with milk and honey. And their children whom he raised up in their stead, then Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. You say, why I bring you here? The mystery of iniquity has already always been here. What did he say that part of that circumcision was for? It was to roll off, of, roll off what? I'm sorry, go ahead. The, the reproach of Egypt. This thing is, there's a reproach with Egypt even that went back for the ones that died. I'm going to circumcise you because you came out. You're the ones that are living. I, I'm going to show you the glory of the Lord, what He did for you, that the reproach of Egypt is taken off of you. What do you mean the reproach of Egypt? That thing has been going on since the previous generation was there. What I'm saying to you is that when we get to this mystery of iniquity and we look at it, people think, Oh, it's, n it's never been as bad as it was uh, it is today. 
It's never been as horrible as we see it now. I was talking to Herb a little bit. He, he, act, he talked, which is weird, man. And, 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 hey, man, that's, that's a miracle, man. That's a, yeah, that, that's a big one, man. It was the moving of the waters every, for the 38-year-old man, was, or 38-year man that was in infirmity, man. I'm like, he spoke. Sweet. But we were talking, and he's, he works in, as a CO, and he'll tell you even up in his job, it's horrific now. Just the nature of the, the kids and the inmates coming in now, the total lack of regard for life, lack of respect, the mouth on them, and they're like, they're, they're young, man. It's like, it's not the old G's that are there, have kind of learned the way of doing it. They're just off the hook. Oh, it's never been, no, no, it's, it's been bad, folks, for a long, long time. Are we seeing things accelerate? Sure we are. But remember what he said about the mystery of iniquity. It's, all, it, folk, it's always been here. And yet Jesus Christ still came down here in the midst of it and still died for sins, sins, and sinners and still rose again the third day. So you can't sit there and say, well, the mystery of iniquity is so bad, I'm just going to quit. And let's just sit in the church and not, you know, let's not do anything. Let's stay locked in our house. Let's never hand out a track because nobody's getting saved. They are getting saved. You just may not see it. And whether they get saved because of your witness or not doesn't stop the fact that you're a sower. You're to plant and to water, so am I. And it doesn't matter how bad the world gets or who's in the outhouse or who your senator is or anything. I have a job to do. You heard it last night. We have a job to do for our Savior, regardless of what Caesar does. The, oh, oh, man, it's never been as bad. Do you, have you ever read what some of those people went through with Nero? And the, the Caesar's the title, but the different Caesars, Caligula and all. You ever read some of the stuff they did to Christians? Uh, we're, we're not getting lit on fire tonight. We're not dipped in animal fat and oil and lit on fire. We're not being drawn and quartered. We're not being put on the rack or inside an Iron Maiden. We're sitting in an air-conditioned church with a complete Bible and full salvation on padded chairs. Really not suffering for the Lord. Oh, it's, it's so bad. You see what's going on out there? No, I'm trying to concentrate on my prayer life. How about you? You see what happens? You get consumed by the mystery of iniquity because you don't concentrate on the things that really matter. You know what the greatest part about this mystery of iniquity is? Jesus Christ is going to destroy him. I'm not looking at the beast. I'm looking at Jesus Christ who consumes him with the spirit of his mouth and the, the sword that goes out of his mouth. I don't, the brightness of his coming. I don't care about the Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? Your mother. Your mom's the Antichrist. How's that? Well, Paul, don't say that too loud. This might go out over the ways and Karen will be coming after me and saying, you, you call me Antichrist and her feet will be wiggling back and she'll be losing her mind, man. I, got, I already got enough problems with that, with that lady, so I mean. My point is this, is that I, I don't care what happens to our currency. I care about Jesus Christ coming, man. The mystery, folks, the mystery of iniquity has always been around. I, I, he had, even had to circumcise these folks because it was so horrific. Go with me over to Amos. Go to, over to a famous agent. He was a raging Cajun. Go to Amos. Amos chapter number 2. Just looking at some stuff regarding the mystery of iniquity and how it's always been around, then we'll, then we'll, we'll, we'll get into some, I, I think, some cool Bible verses, but I think they're all cool. I'm weird like that. Uh, Kenny, you already read, so you're doing good, man. Polly, Amos 2, 9 through 16, please. You got it, kid? Okay, man, all right. There you go. Real quick, if you're a Bible marker, a Bible note taker, I would make a note. I'm just saying, if you'd like to be cool like me, I would make a note right there next to Nazarite, number six, if you don't have a reference. That's where you find out what a Nazarite is, what the Lord requires of a Nazarite in their vow, about their hair and the, the uh, gr uh, grapes dried and moist and dead bodies and all that stuff. Number six, the first, oh, six, seven verses will give you the layout of a Nazarite. Jesus Christ, let me just say this before we move on. In Matthew 2, it says uh, he was called a Nazarene. 
not a Nazarite. Uh, you know that that means he's from the town and area of Nazareth because of what Paul did when he fled from Damascus, when he's let down in a basket by the wall. 2 Corinthians 11 says, the Damascenes. What are Damascenes? People that live in Damascus. Now, my, yeah, Mike, I'm, you came to play tonight, Mike, didn't you, man? I'm telling you, man, you did, man. You came to play tonight. The Damascenes are people that live in Damascus. So what do you think a, uh, what do you think a Nazarene is? Oh, you can answer. That's okay. I know you're... Uh, it's somebody who dwells in, it hails, is Nazareth. Jesus Christ is not a Nazarite. That's a specific vow. There's a really famous Nazarite. There's two famous Nazarites in your King James Bible. Just two famous ones. Samson would be one of them. That, the weightlifter says Samson. <laughs> Even though Samson's like probably 110 pounds, man. He's like... <laughs> that's, that would be God to do that, man. Because it would be, it would be, it would be uh, the strength of the Spirit of the Lord, not Him. Not Him taking roids or anything of that nature. The, uh, yeah. who's, the, who's the other Nazarite that would be a fa that's famous? How about John the Baptist? You don't, you don't, people don't think much about that. John the Baptist is a Nazarite, man. Yeah. Con continue reading, please, Paul. Thank you. Let's... Uh, yeah, okay, so we just made, an we made another Bible version. Last week we had a Koran, and now, and now, <laughs> now we, got, we got the new, new, the new N, the NP, BV, BBV, the New Paul Bodybuilders version. There you go. The pe people, on, people watching us on YouTube are going, that guy must be huge, and then he's going to come up there and be like, like, how about 5'6", 155, man? <laughs> hey, let, me, let me push it, protein shake. Seriously. Seriously, man. All right, let's get back to the King James Bible for a minute here. But he gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart of <laughs> wow. full of sheep. Wow. In that day. What's in that day points you to prophetically in your King James Bible. In that day. Takes you to the second coming of the advent. So you say you're crazy this time, but I know where I'm at historically. But did you see right there with me, folks? Verse 15, Neither shall he stand that handleth, uh, that handleth the bow. Who handles a bow in Revelation? Revelation 6, the white horse rider. Nimrod. Type of the Antichrist, man. I wanted to bring you here because you've got the bowman there and you've got the Amorite who looks down at you because he's like a cedar tree. Back then and then in the future, oh yeah. Folks, my point is as we look at this, it's, it, it's, all, it's been here forever. And you, you're not going to get to the judgment seat of Christ as a practical application tonight as we go through this. You're not going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and say, oh, I, I had it worse than... Philadelphia did. I, 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 I had it easier than Sardis. No, you're going to stand on your own merits and give your own account for the day and age you lived in. How can God hold you accountable against the church in Philadelphia when they had an open door that no man can open or shut? You're going to be held accountable for what you did in Laodicea. But just know this, the mystery of iniquity has always been working. It's been, it, it worked in Philadelphia. It worked in Sardis. It worked in Samaria. It's been working since Genesis, man. It's been working even before. We know the record of the God recreating what he flooded out in Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2. Go with me over to Ezekiel. That this, this would be a good one. Ezekiel 28. You know, we, we made mention of it a little bit earlier. Go to Ezekiel 28, please. Ezekiel 28, please. Megan, could you read this for us, please? Ah, you knew the yeah, you knew it. You knew it. Hey, <laughs> see you, see ya. Ezekiel 28. She left the body of Christ. 
She can't be saved. <laughs> That's just real life, man. I, I, I don't... Okay, it's time. I don't get how preachers get on people for showing up in jeans and a t-shirt if they just worked all day. Yeah. Or they're sweaty or dirty and all that stuff. Thank God you're here. Yeah. You know what Dr. Peacock says, man? It's so, it's so wild because he just... You know he could bench press you and snap your neck if he wanted to. But he's like, I don't... He goes, I don't care if you fall asleep in church because I know some of you worked literally a, between a 10 and a 14 hour shift because of your job. And he goes, if I see you K out, I'm not calling you out. You know, I knew preachers that used to clap at a certain time during a service and they didn't clap for emphasis like I did on Sunday with the rapture. That was spirit filled. The, these guys are not. I'm just saying, and they clap to wake up. You don't know what that person's been through, man. Cut them some slack. Man, I'm not being smart, but... Got to go to work, man. Somebody's got to support Mike. Seriously, man. <laughs> 20, 20, 28, 11, man. Uh, Melissa, fittingly, you'll be reading about the serpent and the anointed cherub. So go on. No, I, I need you to get 11. Oh, this is going to be a good one. I need you to get 11 through 15. I mean, you could go so far with this, but go 11 through 15 is good. Actually, 11 through 17 would be good. Nah, 19. You got to do it. I'm sorry, Mo. Just go 11 through 19. Mm-hmm. Yep. There you go. There it is. Wow. See how many times iniquity or iniquities pop up with this boy because that's what was in him? Well, just where do you think his son, the son of perdition, the man of sin, where do you think he's going to get his iniquity from? The old man. And the old man's been full of it since Jump Street, man. It's, all, it's, it's always been working. Why has God let that happen? I don't know. I, I, why does He just stop it? Couldn't He have just stopped it? Yeah, then you wouldn't be saved. I mean, you don't think about it. Brother James mentioned a little bit about it on, on uh, Monday night, but they're out of that garden. They have no access to the tree of life. And says says specifically, that tree of life is protected. They're not getting back in there because if they take of that fruit, now they know the, the good and evil, guess what's going to happen to them? They're going to die knowing good and evil and die perpetually as sinners. They're not in. They can't go back in. We're, we're not letting you they, set a watch, get some cherubs and the flaming, the flaming sword of fire and to let it keep turning and don't let them back in. And that's all downhill from there. Cain and Abel. It's rough stuff, man. It's rough stuff. You know what's interesting about that whole thing? And then we'll move on. Cain is one of your most profound types of antichrist in the King James Bible. He was all that wicked one, right? First John chapter number two. You know what's really interesting to me? When you read Genesis 5 and that registry, that chronology, you go to First Chronicles chapter number one, which who reads that nowadays? And you read that, you know, you know who's not mentioned in those registries? Cain and Abel. 
you don't you don't get to Hebrews and you get to a point in Matthew 23 with Abel, but you don't you don't hear much and you don't hear much about Cain. You hear about him in Jude, right? You hear about him in First John too. But I mean, the reality is they're they're not listed in the genealogy trail. It goes Adam, Seth. This is something. Point being, this this thing's been going on from day one, and the devil, the iniquity, now his son in the future, Cain, and you know uh, Absalom, Judas Iscariot, uh, Nabal. Just keep on going down the road. All those figures and types of, of the Antichrist. It's been working, folks, for for literally millennia. Go with me over to uh, Mac. I need you to get uh, a Galatians chapter one. We're doing good. Galatians chapter 1. Oh, we have a question or a comment? or we're gonna... Okay. I looked at James. He had a really terrified look like he wanted to say something. But then I realized he was just scared, and that's okay, man. He was going the Gravitron ride at the Big E, which I loathe. I hate that. What's that? That's... Oh, I've done that before, man. You know, you're like... And then the tears start welling up anyway because you've got a yawn, man. Don't ever fall asleep in front of me again, son. No, go. To, oh, the bow. That would be... Well, let's go there very quickly. Go to Revelation chapter 6. I want to say it's down around verse 4, but that would I'd rather read it and be give you the correct reference. It is... I'm sorry, it's 6-2. One, one of Paulie's favorite wishes to be 6-2. So. 6-1 six, six says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. I know you're saying thank you not to have me read it, but I'm going to read it anyway. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering to conquer. That is not Jesus Christ. I don't have to tell this crowd that. Jesus Christ has a sword. He also has many crowns. And he's called, his name is the Word of God. And he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not this joker. All right, let's go back to Mac. I need to get to Galatians chapter 1. Any other questions or comments at this moment? James, yawning? Yes, no, talk to me. All right, James. Uh, all right, <laughs> Galatians chapter 1, man. Galatians chapter 1. Mac, I need to get 1 through 5, please. I don't, you, you probably remember, we spent some time in Galatians. He said this present evil world 2,000 years ago. This present evil world. And you're 2,000 years removed from that. And man is not increasing in godliness. He's decreasing. He seducers, evil men, waxing worse and worse. Save people acting like they're not. No sense of holiness, no, no faithfulness to their Savior. Well, that, that was going on 2,000 years ago. Demas was 2,000 years ago. People abandoned Paul 2,000 years ago. Folks, this thing's been going on. The mystery of iniquity has been working. It's just whether or not I'm a child of God. Am I going to do what he told me to do and stay faithful to him until I see him by death or rapture? It's all going to be your personal drive with it. And you've got to do it whether your wife or your husband or your children or your job wants you to or not. I, I don't care how that lands. I don't care how you take it. I don't care how you, you think about it. You're going to give an account and so am I to our Savior. And that should strike terror in you in a good way. That doesn't mean be disobedient or be a jerk or obnoxious or any of that stuff. It means... I have a goal in mind to stand in front of my Savior one day and tell Him everything I did for Him in the flesh, whether it's good or bad. This, is always, this has always been going on, the mystery of iniquity. Oh, you know, I can't take it. Christians are dropping out. 
I, I, where, where can I go to worship and pray? Where can I do? Uh, plenty of places. Do you know if your preacher falls out of it, that's a horrible thing? But that doesn't give you an excuse for you to fall out of it? I don't want to fall out of it. I don't want any of you to fall out of it. But if your preacher or your favorite preacher or your favorite pastor or your favorite whatever leader, spiritual leader, falls out, they've been falling out forever. What are you going to do in your walk with Jesus Christ? Does it stink? Yes, it does. I get tired of hearing saved people quitting and dropping out and falling out and making excuses and just and crying and whining about things and don't realize the greatness of their Savior. Folks, this has been going on for as long as Lucifer was created, that iniquity has been around. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. A couple more, and we'll shut her down. Ephesians 5. Mikey Mike, Ephesians 5. Ride the wave, kid. Ride the wave. Ephesians 5, man. It's having a good night, man. He's three for four, a couple doubles, single. Oh, yeah, man. He's driven in four or five runs. It's a good night, man. Uh, Mike, can you get Ephesians 5, 11 through 16, please? <laughs> That's the candies, man. Yeah. All, yeah, the lollipop man, the lollipop guild. Yeah. All kidding aside, I'm not being smart. I say this: your Bible was in that back seat. Yeah. Which which shelf? I thought I'm not telling you. The mystery of Kenny doth already work. It's five. It's five eleven. Through 16, please. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying not to right now, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They are evil. Present right then. Great, greatest New Testament Christian just told you this present evil world, oh, and, and, and redeem the time, you know, because the days are evil. Evil back, oh, yeah, they, actually they've always been evil on this earth. When the devil gets involved, when just plainly when man's hands and man's will and man's mind gets involved, it's, folks, if you're not saved, what's the Bible say in Ephesians 2? And you have the quicken who were what? Dead in trespass sins. Where in time past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh where? In the children of disobedience. They are controlled by the spirit of their father. He's been around since the Lord created him. So the mystery of iniquity has been, men have always been evil left to themselves, left to their own designs. I'll, you know what, let me do this. Let, let me write down the commandments in plain Hebrew for you on tablets, front and back. Now, yeah, thanks, but we're going to do it our way. We're going to make a golden calf. You know what, let me, let me give you a whole priesthood that I will detail up to the age of 50 what they're supposed to do and then how you rotate them out during different seasons and different years and all that. Let me give that to you. Yeah, we're not, the Levites are corrupt. We see that in the book of Hosea. Okay. Let me send you my son from heaven. Yeah, we don't want him to rule over us either. Do you understand, folks, the mystery of iniquity has been going on? It doth already work. But there is a specific point in time in 2 Thessalonians, and we will pare this down the next week or two or seven or eight, is that when the tribulation period and that veil gets torn off this guy, he's going to go off the rails against Israel. 
and you're going to see the devil incarnate like you saw God incarnate when he walked this earth. All right, Frank, before I lose you, go to 1 John, man. Frank's still recovering from his big trip on Monday, man. It's like he went to Bolivia and came back. He's like, oh, I don't know, I can't make it, man. I'm like, Frank, you went to Ledger, you didn't go to stinking New Mexico. Come on, kid. First, first John, man. First John. First John chapter 5, if you could read from 14 to the end of the chapter, Frank, and we'll, we'll shut her down for the evening. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will... That's pretty big right there, huh? Real quick, so that's real big, isn't it? Because this is what most people think about when they pray. I ask it. I ask in Jesus' name. Therefore, presto, changeo, it's going to happen. What do those four words say that you just read there? According. We know what the will of God is. It's spelled out in the King James Bible. You know what the will of God is. But what happens is people get sour with the Lord because He did not answer them at their beck and call like He's a bellhop. And He didn't give them what they desired according to His will. That's a rough one, man. Because ultimately the will of God is contrary to my will. Let's be honest about it. Most of your prayers and my prayers are selfish. Is there a time to be selfish when you're praying? Sure there is. Father, I need wisdom today. Would you give me some wisdom? Sure. Ask me. There you go. I give it deliberately to every man. I ask it and I braideth not. You can have that. Uh, Father, I, I need some humility today. Look out for that one. That'll be a good one. You'll trip over stuff that's not even there. I'm just saying, man, there are, there are things you should be selfish about. Uh, Peter said, Lord, save me. Shows how short of a prayer life you can get away with. And the Lord reached down his hand and pulled him up. But most of our prayers are selfish in a bad way. Well, according to his will, would help that quite a bit. You won't get sour when you don't get what you think you asked for with the right heart and right intent. And the Lord's like, no, let me, let me filter that through the Spirit of God to make you more like my son. Romans 8, right? We know that all things work together for good. You can't read that verse without the ones before it about being conformed to the image of his son and the one after it. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? To make every saved person like his son. The next verse. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's how Romans 8.28 works. Romans 8.28 doesn't work when, you're, when your child gets crushed by a car and you walk up to the person at the funeral and go, Romans 8.28. And you know say people do that because they just don't know, have any... They don't have any... There's no... You, don't, you want to say common sense, but it's not common, so they have no, just have no sense. And most of all, they have no Bible sense. But according to His will, will help you in your prayer life and help you with answers to prayer or not answers to your prayer. Because He's doing it to fashion you to be more like His Son. Go ahead, Frank, finish it up. I just had to get that off my chest. It was really weighing heavy on me. Go ahead, Frank. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Mm. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life mm -hmm. for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. And that's going to take it into the tribulation period. And Jonathan, don't ask me what it is. And James, you don't say a word. Keep on going. <laughs> but that is a real thing. There is a sin that leads. I mean, I know, I know for the wages of sin is death. I understand that. But there's going to be a specific sin because 1 John is loaded with tribulational stuff as well as the general epistle, Jew, Gentile, Church of God. But it definitely has a tribulational flavor to it. And there will be a sin unto death. Okay, I can't, yeah, I got, sorry. See, I, you guys trapped me again, and I didn't even want to do that. You're controlling me again with your minds. Go ahead. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Mm-hmm. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches them not. Interesting, he just stuck the wicked one in there. 
What's the guy that's personified in 2 Thessalonians? That what? Wicked, capital W. It's down in New York City. You can go watch it anytime you want, man. And we know that we are of God. Look at this. And the whole world is in wickedness. <laughs> really? And we know that the Son of God has come and Amen. Has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. We are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God Amen. and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Verse 19, the last half says what? The whole world lieth in wickedness. What did he say back in Genesis 6 5? The man's heart, imagination of his heart was what? Only what? You did sit on Sunday. Only evil what? We may not be quite to continually, but we're pretty close there. But it's already been here. It's, there's nothing new under the sun. So what do I do as a child of God? I'm supposed to shine as, and we're supposed to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation because we represent the true light. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you do, man. Folks, it's not going to get better before the rapture or before you die. But it is going to get better when one of those two things happen or both happen or to a child of God, man. But keep on plowing for the Lord, man. Kenny, pray for us, please, and we'll get out of here. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. I thank you for uh, this mystery that we're going through and uh, the pastor is teaching us and showing that the mystery of iniquity is, is present in this evil world and, and going through it and being cautious towards it and knowing that we do have a Savior that yeah, amen. is yeah, amen. all and, and can help us through amen. an iniquity in our lives, in our heart, and that um, someone does have something in their heart that they know that they can go to the Lord with, with anything. I just love it about him that we can Amen. pray to him, that we can ask of him, and he'll be there right when you want him to be. And, um, it's, it's a great God to serve, and it's not like any of the other ones that are false and that yeah, need amen. you to serve him. I want to serve him. It's, it's a great time. And I just think for all the preaching that is this week, and um, it's been great. It's been. Um, Wonderful and yeah, amen. that we take it into practice and that we put our feet towards it and towards you and uh, for just the gospel itself and having the lost world here. And yeah, amen. Saving knowledge that your son is the way, the truth, and the life. Just thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A little yard goats tomorrow night. Only two more games. We'll go. Uh, we'll go tomorrow night, Thursday, and then Tuesday will be the last one next week.